In October of 210 BC, Qin Shi Huang embarked on his fifth and final eastern tour, which would also be the last significant journey of his life. He set out from Xianyang and by November had arrived at Yunmeng. From there, he followed the course of the river, passing through Danyang and Tiantang, before reaching Kuaiti. His travels took him through Wudi, along the coastline northward, until he finally arrived at Langya. The vast and profound sea halted the emperor's progress but also sparked endless contemplation within him. In Langya, Qin Shi Huang once again met Xu Fu. Nine years earlier, a group of alchemists told Qin Shi Huang about divine mountains overseas, inhabited by immortals and the elixir of eternal life, among whom was Xu Fu. Qin Shi Huang invested a huge sum of money to sponsor their quest for these mythical lands. Six years later, not only did these alchemists return empty-handed, but some also spoke ill of Qin Shi Huang in private. As a result, Qin Shi Huang had those who criticized him executed in Xianya. Strangely, when Xu Fu once again appeared before him, Qin Shi Huang did not punish him. Xu Fu explained, the elixir from Peng Lai is obtainable, but often thwarted by giant fish, making it impossible to reach. I wish to request skilled archers to accompany us, to shoot them with crossbows upon sighting. It seemed Xu Fu was not one to reap benefits without effort, his repeated voyages in search of the elixir were indeed hampered by giant fish, necessitating an armed force of skilled archers. That very night, Qin Shi Huang dreamt of wrestling with the sea god. He consulted a dream interpreter, who said, water gods should not be seen, they manifest as great fish and dragons. Now that meticulous sacrifices have been made, yet such malevolent spirits appear, they must be vanquished to invite benevolent deities. Evil spirits of the sea could transform into great fish or dragons and must be eliminated to welcome benevolent spirits. Thus, Qin Shi Huang personally set out to sea to slay these malevolent spirits. His fleet patrolled up to Rongchengshan without spotting any water gods. It was in Chufu that a giant fish was finally found and killed by the people. The story ends abruptly here. After achieving the feat of slaying gods, Qin Shi Huang soon fell ill and died without ever obtaining the elixir of life. As for Xu Fu, his whereabouts remained unknown. Where did he travel after setting sail? Did he find the three divine mountains? These questions have been lost to history. In later generations, Xu Fu's journey to the east became a legend that spread across East Asia. From Tiozhou in the south to Qingsun in Japan, as well as Tizhou Dao and Fushan in Korea, there are legends of Xu Fu landings, with some even claiming that Cheng Wu Tianhuang of Japan was Xu Fu himself, making Xu Fu a testament to a bygone era. Records of the Grand Historian, Shi Ji, is the earliest text that documents the tales of Xu Fu, mentioning him in three instances. The first instance is found in the Annals of Qin Shi Huang, dated 219 BC. People from Qi, including Xu Fu, reported that there were three divine mountains in the sea, named Peng Lai, Fang Zhang, and Ying Zhou, inhabited by immortals. They requested permission to fast and take children of both genders in search of these immortals. Consequently, Qin Shi Huang dispatched Xu Fu with thousands of boys and girls into the sea in search of these immortals. This narrative reflects ancient people's fascination with the boundless sea and their imagination of a fantastical world within it, giving rise to various myths, including the one about the three divine mountains inhabited by immortals, where splendid palaces house the elixir of immortality. During the Warring States period, this legend became popular among the nobility of states like Qi, Zhao, and Ye. These high-ranking officials, having enjoyed earthly luxuries, set their sights on the mysteries beyond the seas, sending fleets to explore. After the Qin state conquered the six states, the legends from Qi land deeply captivated Qin Shi Huang, who was from the northwest inland. Thus, when Xu Fu and others proposed a voyage to seek immortals, Qin Shi Huang readily agreed. In Sima Qian's accounts, we know Xu Fu was from Qi and the three divine mountains were located in the Bohai. See, not far from the mainland. The second instance, from the Annals of Qin Shi Huang, dated 210 BC, reads, The alchemist Xu Fu and others went to sea in search of the elixir of life. After several years without success and fearing reprimand, they falsely claimed that the elixir from Peng Lai could be obtained, but they were often thwarted by a giant fish, making it impossible to reach. They requested skilled archers to accompany them, to shoot the fish with crossbows upon sighting. Xu Fu's attempt to venture into the sea was hindered by a giant fish. This indicates that nearshore navigation was feasible but fraught with unknown risks. To the ambitious Qin Shi Huang, Xu Fu was undoubtedly a good alchemist, and the emperor continued to sponsor his voyages without punishment. The third account is found in the biographies of Huainan and Hingshan, from, Qin Shi Huang also sent Xu Fu to the sea in search of divine and strange objects. Upon return, he fabricated a story, 
I saw a great deity in the sea, who asked if I was a messenger from the Western Emperor. I replied yes, and when asked what I sought, I requested the elixir of life. The deity said, the gifts from your Qing King are insufficient, you may observe but not take. I was then led to Penglai Mountain, saw palaces made of zhi, encountered messengers of copper color and dragon form, whose light shone up to the heavens. I asked what offerings would be suitable, and the sea god said, male and female youths, along with various craftsmen, would suffice. Qin Shi Huang was pleased and sent 3,000 boys and girls, along with seeds and craftsmen. Xu Fu then found vast plains and marshes, stopping the king from coming. In these accounts, Xu Fu becomes a tangible figure, having expended considerable human, material, and temporal resources in pursuit of immortality. Fearing the wrath of Qin Shi Huang, he concocted a story. According to the tale, Xu Fu encountered immortals but was told that offerings of young boys and girls, along with various craftsmen, were needed to obtain the elixir of life. Qin Shi Huang believed him. Consequently, Xu Fu led 3,000 men and women to see, reached a plain, proclaimed himself king, and never returned. These records offer insights into the composition of Xu Fu expedition. It included thousands of young people, seeds for agriculture, craftsmen, and undoubtedly skilled archers capable of using repeating crossbows. If we set aside Sima Qian's criticisms of Qin Shi Huang's quest for immortality, it's plausible that Xu Fu fleet was an expeditionary force funded by Qin Shi Huang to explore and settle new lands. Generally, it's believed that Sima Qian wouldn't fabricate a character out of thin air, so Xu Fu likely existed. However, Sima Qian's brevity leaves much about Xu Fu shrouded in mystery, fueling further speculation and imagination in later generations. As the Chinese became more knowledgeable about the ocean, the stories of Xu Fu became clearer and more intricate. Records of the Three Kingdoms mention, Tanzhou is in the sea, where elders say Qin Shi Huang sent the alchemist Xu Fu with thousands of young girls to seek the divine mountains of Penglai and the elixir of life. He landed on this island and never returned. Over generations, their population grew to tens of thousands. People from Tanzhou sometimes come to Kuaiti to trade, and sailors from Kuaiti have been blown off course and ended up on Tanzhou. This indicates that Xu Fu reached Tanzhou. Furthermore, the Book of the Later Han adds after the account of the Wa that there are also Yizhou and Tanzhou. It is said that Qin Shi Huang sent the alchemist Xu Fu with thousands of young boys and girls to the sea in search of immortality in Penglai. Fearing execution for his failure to return, Xu Fu settled on this island, and their descendants number tens of thousands. This account suggests the possibility that Xu Fu might have gone to Japan. During the later Zhou dynasty of the Five Dynasties period, a monk named Yi Chu from Kaiyuan Si in Tijou was the first to clearly mention that Xu Fu went to Japan. In his Yi Chu Liu Tie, he recorded, the country of Japan, also known as Wu Guo, is in the East Sea. During the Qin era, Xu Fu arrived in this country with 500 boys and 500 girls, and now its people and customs are just like those of Tang'a. Furthermore, a thousand li to the northeast, there is a mountain named Fu Shi, also called Peng La. Xu Fu stayed here, calling it Peng Lai, and to this day, his descendants are known as the Qin family. He learned this story from a Japanese monk, indicating that the tale of Xu Fu reaching Japan existed at least since the Tang Dynasty. Subsequently, the notion that Xu Fu went to Japan became widely accepted. For instance, there's a Song Dynasty poem titled Jiban Dao Ge, which, although included in Ouyang Xiu collected works, was likely composed by Sima Guo. The poem mentions Xu Fu bringing various craftsmen and even pre qin texts to Japan, aligning with stories of large-scale Qin migration to Korea and Japan, spreading Chinese civilization. Since the Song Dynasty, legends of Xu Fu have been widespread in Hebei, Shandong, Jiangsu, Zhejiang, and other coastal regions, with over a dozen seaside locations claiming to be the departure point of Xu Fu journey eastward. The story of Xu Fu continues to evolve even today. In 1982, a natural village named Xu Fu was discovered in Ganyuxian, Jiangsu province. Scholar Luo Qihu posited that this was Xu Fu hometown, sparking a Xu Fu culture craze. History layers upon itself. Sometimes, the more we explore a historical narrative, the more our imaginations embellish it. The tale of Xu Fu eastward journey reflects a great maritime age. After unifying China, Qin Shi Huang frequently toured the country, with coastal regions being his most visited destinations. From the north's Zhifuan Tieshi to the south's Kuaiti, he often had inscriptions made to extol his virtues during these tours. He also took several voyages on large ships, holding court on the sea. Why would an emperor from the inland northwest be so fascinated by the ocean? Mozi Fagong Part 2 offers a perspective, 
to unify all under heaven and bring together the four seas. After Qin conquered the six states, it was said to have pacified the realms within the seas. The Han people would later say, with the six kings defeated, the four seas are one. Here, within the seas signifies the whole world, with the seas representing a politically charged boundary. Once the realm was unified under Qin and its territories expanded to the seashore, Qin Shi Huang naturally developed a feeling that the ocean, too, should be under his dominion. This represented a tremendous ambition and a concept of owning the ocean, aligning with Qin's temperament of breaking forth from the inland to expand thousands of miles. More than 2,000 years ago, people already possessed advanced coastal navigation skills. For instance, after you conquered Wu, Gu Jian, constructed an observatory at Langya, spanning seven li in circumference, to gaze upon the East Sea. He had 8,000 death-defying warriors and 300 armed ships. People living along the coast were also accustomed to deriving benefits from the sea. Records of the Grand Historian notes that Qi, engaged in commerce and artisanal work, took advantage of the profits from fish and salt, attracting many people to Qi, making it a powerful state. During the Warring States period, the thinker Zhou Yan from Qi proposed a cosmology, the Great Nine Provinces theory. This theory divided the world into nine parts, with China occupying one, called the Divine Land Shen Zhou. Within the Divine Land were the nine provinces mentioned in Tribute of You, which are referred to as the Lesser Nine Provinces. Beyond China lay eight great provinces. Beyond the Great Nine Provinces was the vast ocean. It's conceivable that a significant number of people from Qi ventured overseas, forming such speculations about the world beyond. First encounter with Xu Fu likely exposed him to such maritime knowledge, fueling his belief in the existence of divine mountains overseas. Otherwise, Qin Shi Huang would not have agreed to fund Xu Fu maritime expeditions, which cost tens of thousands. This blend of ambition, curiosity, and the intellectual climate of the time spurred Qin Shi Huang's support for Xu Fu quests, marking an early chapter in China's long history of exploration and interaction with the maritime world. In historical records, Qin Shi Huang's pursuit of immortality led him to be deceived by Xu Fu. However, his ambition to conquer the sea seems genuine. He resettled 30,000 households at Langyatai, the largest migration outside of Guangzhou, exempting these immigrants from corvée labor for 12 years, a privilege unmatched at the time. He also stayed there for three consecutive months, marking the longest period Qin Shi Huang spent outside of Xianya. The alchemists from Yan'anxi can be seen as part of a knowledgeable group from the coastal regions, actively exploring the sea. They often appeared cunning, ambitiously pursuing wealth and status, traits characteristic of maritime pioneers. The exact destination of Xu Fu remains historically unverified. However, the navigational capabilities of that era are evident from related records. About a century after Qin Shi Huang's death, Emperor Wu of the Han Dynasty dispatched General Yang Pu with a fleet of tower ships to attack Korea via sea, with an army of 50,000. The distance from Weihai to the landing site of the tower ship army in Iaco is about 180 nautical miles, while the voyage from Korea's Fushan to Japan's Xiaguan is only about 120 nautical miles. If Xu Fu fleet resupplied at a southern port on the Korean peninsula before continuing eastward to Japan, it is highly plausible. In 210 BC, Qin Shi Huang personally took to the sea to eliminate the maritime obstacles encountered by Xu Fu, an act symbolic of the emperor's authority over the divine. By venturing into the sea to slay malevolent spirits and welcome benevolent ones, the emperor demonstrated his power to choose which deities to honor, asserting his supremacy over the gods and the sea. A similar story occurred on the Xiangjia. When Qin Shi Huang faced strong winds while crossing the river, almost preventing his passage, he inquired about the deity of Xiang and learned it was related to Yao daughter and Shun wife. Refusing to let these spirits impede his crossing, he ordered 3,000 convicts to clear the trees from Xiangshan, turning the residence of the water deity into a bare, reddish hill. The ideology that all lands under heaven belong to the king, and all peoples under heaven are subjects to be commanded, was emblematic of Qin Shi Huang's reign. This power was meant to conquer all, not allowing religious beliefs to supersede imperial authority. Qin Shi Huang's fascination with the sea can indeed be described as a possessive kind of love. To satisfy this, he even constructed a maritime model within his palace gardens in Xianyang. The emperor based in Chang'an, drew water from the Wei River to create a pond, built representations of Peng Lai and Ying, and carved stones into whales, 200 zhang in length. Moreover, the design of Qin Shi Huang Mausoleum is said to have used mercury to represent the hundreds of rivers, the Yangtze and Yellow Rivers, and the Great Seas, mechanically circulated.
In modern times, researchers have found unusually high levels of mercury in the soil of Qin Shi Huang burial mound, likely confirming the use of mercury. This emperor, who yearned for the sea, now eternally rests within a great sea. The legend of Xufu voyage eastward transcends Chinese history, becoming a symbol within the entire East Asian cultural sphere. According to Japanese scholars, from the Nara period to before 1945, there were 157 records mentioning Xufu journey to Japan. Many Japanese classics, such as The Tale of Genji and The Diary of Lady Murasaki, recount the tale of Xufu seeking the elixir of immortality. In Japan, the legend of Xufu is widely popular among the general public. There are over a hundred sites related to Xufu legends, including shrines, tombs, and steles dedicated to him. People with the surname Yutian believe themselves to be descendants of Xufu, as Yutian sounds similar to Qin in Japanese, claiming that after Xufu arrived in Japan, his descendants took the surname Qi. In modern times, based on the myth-filled Neon Shoki, some have even claimed that the Emperor Shengwu is Xufu, a notion recognized by the Japanese imperial family. The brother of Emperor Zhao He, Prince Sanli Gong, even publicly stated, Xufu is the father of our nation, Japan. Similarly, the legend has long been widespread and beloved in Korea. In the late Silla period, the scholar Tui Zhiyuan wrote, sailing across the Blue Sea, with the strong wind carrying me 10,000 li riding a raft, thinking of Han's emissaries, harvesting herbs, recalling Qin's youth, beyond the sun and the moon, within the great unity of heaven and earth. Peng Lai seems but a step away, I shall seek the immortal sage. This reflects the enduring fascination and cultural significance of Xufu legend across East Asia, intertwining with the region's history, literature, and identity. During the Goryeo period, Korean scholars believed Xufu eastward journey to Japan and even regarded Xufu as a cultural symbol of Japan. Scholar Jiang Hang noted in his Kanyang Lu, Xufu, with boys and girls, sailed into the sea, reaching Wu into Yizhou at Xiongyeshan where he settled. There is still a shrine to Xufu on Xiongyeshan, and his descendants are now known as Qin Shi, being called the progeny of Xufu. However, many Korean scholars also believed Xufu had visited Korea, with part of his fleet drifting to Jeju Island, where they settled and established a foundation. Esteemed literary figure of the Joseon era, Piao Zhiyuan, wrote in his renowned Zhe He Ji, the alchemists spoke of three divine mountains in the sea, Peng Lai, Fang Zhang, and Yingzhou. The Japanese believe these places are within their country, while our country considers Jingangshan as Peng Lai, Hanashan in Jeju as Yingzhou, and Zhiyishan as Fang Zhang. Given the transportation conditions of that time, it's conceivable that ships could have drifted to either Japan or Korea as they pleased. This implies that Xufu fleet scattered, some reaching Korea and others Japan, satisfying both sides without dispute. Evidently, both Korea and Japan have extended the story of Xufu journey eastward, accepting it as a part of their real history. This likely stems from the significant role of the eastward transmission of Han culture in both countries' histories. With their own histories lacking in prominence, they sought to enhance their stature by borrowing from Chinese history. Through generations, Xufu eastward journey became a part of their history. Therefore, Xufu voyage became a shared symbol within the East Asian cultural sphere. However, whenever relations among China, Japan, and Korea change, there's a tendency to reform by invoking antiquity, adding or modifying parts of this history to suit contemporary contexts. In 1339, Bei Tian Qinfang, Shen Huang Zheng Tongji as the first official Japanese history to mention Qin Shi Huang fascination with immortality and Xufu mission to Japan for the elixir of life, also claimed this occurred before the burning of books and burying of scholars, suggesting Xufu brought pre-Qin texts to Japan, thereby preserving the complete works of Confucius only in Japan. During that era, many Japanese monks visited China to present books, most of which were Buddhist scriptures, but there were also many lost works from the Middle Kingdom. This revelation shocked many, sparking hopes for the existence of lost Chinese texts and complete ancient versions overseas. In response to a request from the Song dynasty, Goryeo also contributed a significant number of unique versions of texts. In the Edo period, after the Ruben Daoge was introduced to Japan, it was highly regarded as evidence to establish Japan's cultural legitimacy. The notion that ancient texts lost in China but preserved in Japan gave Japan more cultural authority. Thus, Japanese scholars began searching for these ancient texts, even using the Siku Quan Shu Zong Mu Tiao as a guide for their search. Hearing of this, Korean envoys visited Japan, hoping to see these ancient Chinese texts, further stimulating Japan's quest for ancient books. 
Chinese scholars, unable to contain their excitement, also traveled to Japan to collect overseas literature. The situation with the Ruben Daoge essentially reflected the idea of seeking in the wild for what was lost in civilization. During the Tang Dynasty, China was replete with various imported goods, except for Han literary works, as there was no need to seek its own culture from weaker neighbors. After the chaos of the Five Dynasties period, the Song Dynasty, with a need for cultural construction, sought ancient books from neighboring countries. China, as the cultural suzerain, admitting that the great canons of ancient kings might exist among barbarians, underscores the Chinese confidence in maintaining their status as the cultural orthodox. The Japanese, eager to find classics, were undergoing a cultural transformation and sought to leverage the orthodoxy of Confucianism to reinterpret it. Even centuries after Xu Fuera, despite humanity's expansion across seas, China remained the center of the world order. By the Ming and Qing dynasties, Chinese emperors became wary of the vast ocean. Ultimately, the force from the seas, unmatched, ended the ancient order, marking a significant shift in the global balance of power. If you like this video, please remember to like and subscribe, your support is my motivation to update the video, thank you.